Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's event on millennial migration and the future of cities. I'm Michael Hendricks, Director of State and Local Policy here at MI, and we're delighted to be joined today by Joe Courtright of City Observatory to talk about his new report on young and restless Americans, the talented few who over the past decades have packed up and moved to denser urban frontiers. Uh, now, with the pandemic and urban unrest, it also feels as if our cities are at a crossroads. So what is the future of this famous return to the city? After Joe shares his findings, we'll kick off our conversation. So uh, please, throughout our program, please enter your questions on any of the platforms you're watching us on, and I'll wrap them into our discussion. Also, please consider subscribing to Manhattan Institute's newsletters or making a contribution to our mission. We've posted the links for doing so right in the comments window on your screen. And now, Joe Courtright. Joe runs City Observatory, a website and think tank devoted to data-driven analysis of cities and the policies that shape them. He's also president and principal economist of Impressa, a consulting firm specializing in regional economic analysis, innovation, and industry clusters. Over the past two decades, he specialized in studying urban economies, like developing the City Vitals framework with CEOs for cities. Joe's work in particular casts a light on the role of knowledge-based industries in shaping regional economies. And with that, now over to you, Joe. Give us your findings. Thanks very much, Michael. It's great to be with you today. And um, I'm happy to share with you the results of the report we released um, last month. And the title of the report is Youth Movement, uh, Accelerating America's Urban Renaissance. And as you alluded to, uh, we've been tracking this group we call the Young and the Restless um, for uh, more than 15 years now, uh, basically looking at where well-educated young adults are choosing to live in the United States. And as, as we increasingly transition to um, a knowledge-driven economy where um, the availability of skilled labor is critical to the success of firms and regional economies, uh, where smart young people choose to live uh, has a huge impact on, um, on those regional economies and their success. And what we're trying to do is really understand uh, the, the nature of that movement over time. And then also to look forward to think about what it implies uh, for the future of cities. So just by way of quick introduction on the next slide, um, <clears throat> if you aren't familiar with us at City Observatory, uh, as Michael alluded to, we have um, a website, obviously, um, and in addition to our uh, own research that we do on a periodic basis, we do uh, daily and weekly commentary on a range of urban policy issues, including economic development, equity, transportation, housing, uh, and as you'll see here, um, uh, industrial development and uh, the role of uh, demographics and migration in influencing that. Um, and the site is available. If you're, if you're interested, you can subscribe <clears throat> to our weekly newsletter as well. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, if we go on to the next slide, I'll just cut to the chase here and give you the key findings from the report. Uh, we focus on this group we call Young and Restless, 25 to 34 year olds who have completed at least a four year degree. And what we found is that that group is increasingly concentrating in what we call the close in urban neighborhoods of the nation's largest metropolitan areas. Uh, the, the key highlights here are that uh, if you look at this demographic group, their numbers in these close in neighborhoods have increased by about a third since 2010. Um, that trend is not driven by just a few places, it's extremely widespread. Every large metropolitan area, that is every metro area with a million or more population has recorded an increase in this, in this demographic group in its close in neighborhoods since 2010. Uh, we also noted that uh, this isn't simply the product of a demographic shift. Um, this group of people are more likely than other Americans to choose to live in those close in urban neighborhoods, about three and a half times as likely as other Americans to be living within three miles of the center of a central business district. Uh, and then finally, and I'll spend some time on the, uh, talking about this towards the end of the presentation, is there's very little evidence so far to suggest that the pandemic, um, or more recently, the urban unrest, is undercutting this momentum of movement to the urban city. In fact, what we see is a, a very long-term, well-established trend um, that's accelerating uh, in cities across the country. So if we go on to the next slide, 
I'll lay a little bit of groundwork here for describing to you um, how we did our analysis and what our definitions are. Uh, I'll start with this demographic group we look at. And a lot of people like to use this term um, millennials. Um, I think we're less interested in that for, for slicing uh, different age groups. We basically focus on this one age group, 25 to 34 year olds, which represents different people uh, in, each time we measure it. Uh, but we look to see um, where those young adults um, in their formative years, in their early career years, uh, and well-educated young adults, those with a four-year degree or higher, uh, are moving. Um, and the interesting thing about this group is really two things. One, first, they are the, the demographic group that is most likely to move long distances in the United States. Uh, we know that migration has slowed in the United States, but among demographic groups, the person who is most likely to move across state lines is a 24-year-old college graduate with a, with a, uh, with a recent BA degree. Uh, the other thing we know about this group is that they basically define the dream demographic of a fast-growing knowledge-based company. If we're talking about a company that's in information technology and business services, in finance, and so on, those people, the people they're looking to hire are basically these, these young, well-educated college graduates, uh, people who have, um, in economic terms, recent vintage human capital. Um, less of what they learned has become obsolete since they graduated from school. And they have a lot of flexibility about what sorts of things, skills they can acquire and, and industries they can move into. So this group of people determines in large part which, which economies flourish. And if you can't easily attract lots of these smart young people, um, it's difficult to grow your economy. And just as an aside, when we looked at Amazon's Headquarters 2 contest of a couple of years ago, it's very clear that the factors that drove them were the accessibility to these well-educated young adults. Where were the markets that had a large pool of, of such workers and to which it was relatively easy to recruit more? So that's the young and the restless. Now let me talk to you a little bit about geography if we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so, um, what we did is we borrowed a, a page from uh, Manhattan Institute's own Ed Glazer uh, in a study that he did about 15 years ago, looking at the structure of metropolitan economies. And what, what Ed did and what we have done is um, construct a radius around the center of the central business district. And in, in our case, we drew a three mile circle, which is what Ed used to define what we call close in urban neighborhoods. And we use census data, tract level data, to count the number of people living within that three mile circle. And just to show you what this looks like for a metropolitan area, this is Seattle, Washington. Uh, the circle that's shown is around the center of downtown Seattle. Um, the green area is the city limits of Seattle. So you can see we're entirely within the city limits of Seattle, but picking up the most central neighborhoods. And the red line is the outline of the metropolitan statistical area, which is considerably larger. So we're really focused on those areas that have the highest levels of density and centrality in each metropolitan area. And then we've replicated this exercise for each of the 52 largest metropolitan areas in the US, every metro with a population of a million or more. And we've looked to see how the number of well-educated young adults and other people living inside that circle has changed over time. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is an aggregation of the data for all 52 of those large metropolitan areas and is the counts of the number of 25 to 34 year olds with a BA um, in those close in urban neighborhoods in each of the last um, major decadal or census years, the 2000 census, 2010 uh, American Community Survey, and then the 2016, which is just, just as an aside, we use the five-year American Community Survey data. Uh, so our, our data are drawn from the period 2014 through 2018, which we identify by the midpoint of the period, 2016. But you can see there um, a steady increase in uh, well-educated young adults living in central cities from about 800,000 in 2000 to about 1.1 million in 2010 uh, to about 1.4 million um, in, uh, in 2016, uh, a 32% increase in that demographic group in, in the space of, of really about six years. Um, so let's, let's look at that. That's the overall. Let's now look at the next slide, which shows you um, the pattern across the landscape. And 
while many um, metrics of urban progress are highly concentrated in a handful of metropolitan areas, um, this trend is extremely widespread. In fact, every single one of the 52 largest metropolitan areas in the US recorded an increase in 25 to 34 year olds in these close in urban neighborhoods since 2010. So it's a universal trend. And just to give a graphic on that, um, we've shown um, you know, basically the location and um, um, number of uh, numeric increase in each metropolitan area in the next slide, um, just to give you a sense of how widespread it is. Um, with increases in, in large markets and small markets, uh, and we could talk more probably when we get into questions about uh, the pattern within metropolitan areas. But the striking thing here is um, that this is a trend that we see in every single large metropolitan area in the US. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to think about is whether this trend is growing or uh, abating. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, and, and you've probably seen some work um, from some folks claiming that um, the, the bloom is off the rose for the urban renaissance. Um, and these uh, claims are really based on um, uh, uh, claims about um, uh, the aggregate level of population and typically in cities. And again, what we're focusing on is these well-educated young adults and how they're changing over time. Uh, and what we found is that they're growing faster um, now than they were in the previous decade in about 80% of large metropolitan areas. So what we did just very briefly was to compute the rate of growth between 2000 and 2010 in this demographic group in close in neighborhoods, and then compare it to the rate of growth uh, from 2010 through 2016. And what you see is an accelerating rate of growth of well-educated young adults in close in urban neighborhoods uh, in 41 of the 52 large metropolitan areas in the United States. So if we go into the next slide, there's a map of that that shows you um, where, um, where it's accelerating, where it's decelerating. And there are a handful, you know, really about seven or eight um, metropolitan areas where it's not grow growing um, very fast. And regionally, it tends to be split. Um, it's mostly a couple of South Florida metro areas and a couple areas in the Eastern United States, St. Louis, and San Diego are also the slow growers. Uh, but again, you see most metropolitan areas are seeing an acceleration of folks in this, um, in this demographic group in close in urban neighborhoods. And if we go on to the next slide, um, the net effect of this movement to urban centers has been to make urban centers um, much better educated um, for this demographic group than the rest of the country. So if you look at close in urban neighborhoods as a whole in large metropolitan areas, the um, BA attainment rate, the four year degree attainment rate is over 60%. If you look at uh, the large metropolitan areas in the aggregate, um, they are also well educated. Uh, about 40% of young adults have completed at least a four year degree. Outside of large metropolitan areas, um, it's only about a quarter of large of, of young adults have completed a four-year degree. So talented young adults are very much clustering in metropolitan areas and within metropolitan areas in those close-in urban neighborhoods. So, <clears throat> so if we go into the next slide, another way to express um, this uh, affinity that young adults have for, for close-in urban neighborhoods is to compute the, um, the relative preference for um, uh, living in uh, close in urban neighborhoods in, uh, in each of these metropolitan areas. And what we've done again is aggregate this for the 50 or so largest metropolitan areas. And it's always been the case that well-educated young adults were more likely than the rest of us to live in close in urban neighborhoods. But the degree to which um, they're more likely than everyone else to live in those neighborhoods has increased over time. So in 2000, uh, a 25 to 34 year old with a four year degree was about 2.7 times as likely as the rest of us to live in one of these neighborhoods. By 2010, about 3.3 times as likely and in 2016, 3.5 times as likely. So the preference of young adults seems to be shifting increasingly toward city living, at least relative to all Americans. So uh, hopefully now we've given you um, the, the key findings on 
the young and restless. We know that um, they're growing in number in the aggregate in large metropolitan areas and in these close in neighborhoods of large metropolitan areas, that that pattern of growth is universal, that it's accelerating in about 80% of metropolitan areas and that what it reflects is a very high concentration and a growing relative preference for urban living among these young adults. So what I'll do now is shift gears and talk a little bit about um, the next uh, issue. Um, the, as, as a journalist friend of mine put this, um, uh, when we were talking a couple of days ago, um, the information I've just given you is all from the before times. Um, um, and obviously a lot has happened uh, in the past few months. And shouldn't that just throw all of this into a cock hat? And um, shouldn't we be um, dismissing it? And um, clearly the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, has had a profound impact on all of our thinking. Um, and as we've noticed in, when we look at the press and particularly in the early days of the, of the pandemic in March and April, um, there was a meme going around. If you go to the next slide, I've, I've selected a few of the very popular headlines uh, from the New York Times, Boston Globe, Financial Times, USA Today, uh, Money and others. Um, basically telling the story that um, that um, people would flee cities in large numbers because of fear of, of the virus. Um, and, um, you know, clearly that was something that was top of people's minds. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. The fact that New York City was hit so hard and so early um, is very much top of mind for a lot of people. Obviously, that's changed very much in the past couple of months. Um, the other thing is I think we have a um, cultural antipathy to cities in many respects that we've inherited. We have this teeming tenements view of uh, urban areas and a belief that somehow city living is unhealthy when in fact, uh, particularly in the last 50 years or so, um, longevity and uh, is, is greater, mortality is lower uh, in urban areas. They tend to be actually healthier places for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, there's still, I think, a, a naive belief uh, that's reflected in these headlines that somehow cities are dangerous and suburbs and rural areas would provide refuge from a pandemic and be healthy. Um, so the big question is, um, are people suddenly fleeing cities? Uh, what data do we have to bear on that? And so contrary to the anecdotes and headlines that you see here, um, we looked at people's actual search activity. So if you go on to the next slide, um, we've got assistance from a couple of the uh, principal vendors of, uh, of real estate in, uh, in, the, in the US, um, Zillow and Apartment List. Uh, and basically what they do is, is, is aggregate their data on the total body of internet real estate search activity in the United States and look to see where people are looking for new homes and new apartments. And uh, Zillow's data, and Zillow tends to focus on the ownership real estate market, but actually covers the whole market. Um, and their finding was that, um, uh, that uh, fear of density is not provoking people to move uh, out of urban cores. In fact, they found traffic to rural listings was up slightly, but urban listings were up while suburban list searching for suburban listings was down. Uh, and that was data basically through the end of April. Uh, and it, just to show you what their data looks market by market, if you go on to the next slide, um, uh, they, they basically track it for every large market in the United States. They found um, that urban markets gained share of search activity in about uh, 29 of the 35 large markets that they follow. So there are a few markets where, where urban activity was down, urban search activity was down slightly. Uh, but overwhelmingly, it was um, uh, uh, um, urban markets that gained market share of searches. People were searching more for housing in um, dense urban markets uh, rather than in less dense suburban markets. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, you can see a um, parallel set of data independently gathered uh, by uh, apartmentlist.com. And they've done a couple of iterations of this. Um, the first one they published in April, um, and I've just published their conclusion here. They concluded that the pandemic wasn't um, scaring renters away from New York, um, that as with the Zillow data, uh, the market share of searches for the city was increasing relative to the suburbs. 
Uh, and last week, uh, Apartment List updated that data with data through the end of June. So if you go on to the next slide, uh, this is a synopsis of what they found. Uh, again, for the, for the 50 or so largest metropolitan areas in the United States. And what they found was that uh, when they look, looked at where people were looking for, for apartments, for the most part, they were looking in places where the density was higher than the place that they were already living. So you look at the density of the place that somebody currently lives in, which they can infer from the, from the IP address of the search, and they look at the housing that they're looking at and they compare the density of the two and find that um, there's been an increase in the share of people who are looking for apartments in higher density places than the ones in which they live. And meanwhile, a decrease in share in, for looking in places that are lower density than the place that they live. And their conclusion is, despite the economic lockdown and health risks attributed to cities, Americans are maintaining an appetite for density. The share of all searches for high density cities actually increased over the first two quarters of 2020. So it's pretty convincing evidence. Um, you know, obviously the best data will be a year or two from now when we see what happens in real estate markets. But in terms of leading indicators of where the market seems to be heading, there's essentially no evidence to suggest uh, that people are um, um, in fear turning away from cities. If anything, it looks like uh, there's an undiluted um, interest in, uh, in urban living. So on to the next slide. Um, you know, and what this really bears out is, and I think will be accelerated by, is a growing appreciation um, that urban density itself is not a, a, a major contributor to COVID-19. Um, early on, obviously, New York was hard hit, but some of the densest cities in the world, Taipei, Singapore, Tokyo, have all successfully had very low rates of infection. Picture there on the right is Vancouver, BC, which has a lower rate of infection than any other, than, than any metropolitan, large metropolitan area in the United States, despite being denser than all but two uh, large U.S. metropolitan areas. So there's very little evidence, even in the North American context, that density is an issue. Meanwhile, uh, the area with the highest rate of infections in the United States is the Navajo Reservation. Uh, so it's very clear that it's, it's about poverty, uh, housing overcrowding, multi-generational living that are big causes of COVID-19, not density. And clearly what's happened uh, with the spread and, and spiking of of the, uh, of the pandemic in the Sun Belt in the past two months. Uh, Sun Belt cities, which on the aggregate have lower densities than, uh, than other cities in the United States, uh, really um, bears out the notion that uh, this isn't about density. Um, so um, the story probably wasn't right in the beginning. It was based on um, an incorrect um, assumption about the connection between density and, and um, the risk of, of COVID-19, but and clearly recent experience has confirmed that. So on to the next slide. Um, I'll just say it's useful to put even uh, today's pandemic and more recently the urban unrest in a, in a longer historical context. Um, there have frequently been messages about, uh, of, of uh, uh, pessimism about cities. Uh, 20 and 25 years ago, in the early days of the internet, we were told by Francis Cairncross, among others, that the internet would produce a death of distance and that we would all decamp to remote mountaintops to be served by fax machines and FedEx delivery drivers. That didn't happen. Uh, in the succeeding two decades, the internet has become you know, much more ubiquitous, much more capable, much more indispensable, but that coincides exactly with the time that these well-educated young adults have been gravitating to cities. Um, and so that, you know, that story of the 1990s wasn't correct. Uh, after 9-11, um, there were similar um, security concerns about cities that we would all fear of living in places that would be targets for terrorist attack. And again, New York's strongest two decades or 15 years uh, in the past century, basically, coincide with the period immediately after 9-11. So it's very clear that whatever concerns people had at the moment, uh, and, it, and I don't want to downplay the fact that people express these concerns in a midst of a crisis, 
Um, but in the long term, there is this tendency for people to um, follow different patterns. And the other thing we know is that cities have weathered these storms in the past. Uh, after the Great Recession in 2007, 8, 9, cities bounced back very strongly. In fact, they led national growth. Uh, and a century ago, uh, in the wake of the previous worst pandemic that we had experienced, um, the 1920s was arguably one of the greatest periods for urban growth in the United States, particularly in the New York metropolitan area. So whatever the effects are of a pandemic, uh, once we get through it on the other side, there's little reason to believe that the fundamentals uh, will be dramatically changed. And so with that, I'll just uh, put up one more slide just to, to highlight the key conclusions. Um, again, we see these well-educated young adults concentrating in urban centers, um, that there's been about a 32% increase uh, in their aggregate numbers in the top 52 metropolitan areas since 2010, uh, that that's a widespread phenomenon in every single metropolitan area, that the rate of growth is accelerating, and there's very little in ev evidence, very little indication that the pandemic is going to blunt this trend. And with that, Michael, I'll turn it back to you. Fascinating. Uh, Joe, these are incredible findings that I can't wait to dig into with you. Uh, the, the findings, some of the nuances, critiques even in the future. Uh, I'll also say, Joe, uh, unlike the migration of young talent, our yes. internet connections can often be frozen in place. We are having some technical difficulties that some of my well-educated young colleagues in the city are working out with their video feed right now. But if it's all right with you, let's just dive right into the findings. Your, your video may be frozen right now, but folks can still hear us and see your findings. So, so Joe, who, which cities are the winners and which ones are the relative losers of this migration well, flow of young talent? I think it's... Um, I mean, I think there, there are leaders and laggers rather than winners and losers among the 52 large cities. And I think some of the striking findings are that even places that we, um, you know, think of as, as deeply troubled, you know, the Detroits, the Clevelands are chalking up pretty significant increases. And that's a very hopeful sign for those cities. Um, so that's a good thing. It, when, if, if, I'm, if I'm to describe losers or pick losers, I think it's really a message about um, smaller metropolitan areas and in particular rural communities. Uh, because when young adults are moving to cities, uh, the, the place that's, that's losing share, I mean, again, all 52 of these large metropolitan areas are gaining people in this demographic group to one degree or another, and in four fifths of them, it's accelerating. So you know, they're clearly all in a sense winning. Um, but the places that are struggling um, are places that, um, that uh, have smaller populations, in particular smaller metropolitan areas. And I think that's a big challenge to, um, to their economic future because so many of the industries that they want to grow are industries that depend on a base of talent. Uh, and they, you know, they face a, you know, a classic chicken and egg problem of if they don't have talent, they can't attract firms. If they don't have firms, they can't attract talent. And, and we'll get and, into yeah. in, a, in a little bit exactly what maybe the suite of policies or solutions can be for some of those cities. I, I do wonder if we can focus on those cities with slowing growth in the young and restless populations. There's, you know, if 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 all of the places that you look at have experienced the rise in this young talent in close in neighborhoods. There's still surely a difference between um, San Diego versus upstate New York, both as, sit, both as areas with slowing growth yeah. in young talent. It must be for different reasons, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, I think just to pick two polar cases, uh, Rochester, New York, San Diego, California. San Diego, California, I think, um, they're bumping up against the limits of what they can accommodate, you know? And that's true of California generally, although when you look at San Francisco, it's remarkable. And we can talk more about the dynamics of this a little bit, um, but you know, the, the housing supply is limited, the prices are very high, it's hard for it to grow rapidly. Um, so in some cities, the rate of growth, and again, San Diego is growing as is everyone else, but it's slower than it was in the previous decade. And I think that's a housing supply issue. In, in some of the distressed cities like Rochester or St. Louis, I think it's that um, 
you know, they're weaker, weaker markets. They're not attractive to as many people. They did better early on. And, and I guess the other thing is that um, we need to think about this uh, as leaders and laggers too. Some places did really well, they had big, big gains in the 90s. Um, Portland, Oregon, which is where I was from, had a phenomenal gain in the 1990s, which it has slowed from. But I think you have to look at, you know, that it, it basically raised the base in that city. So not surprising that, that uh, the growth rate would be somewhat slower. Um, from the 90s, although it has picked up again in the last um, in the last six years, and it, it is worth just really making a, a, a fine point of this that what we're talking about is not something that has just happened over the past handful of years, but this is a multi-decade, almost a generations time frame, twenty or so years uh, at least of this move back to not just cities, but as you said, close in neighborhoods, close to the city center. This is yeah. a long running process. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's that's an important point that I, I don't think I emphasized enough. The reason that we chose these three mile circles is city limits are, are lousy um, uh, geographies for making comparisons across, across the country because city limits vary so much from place to place. Uh, and by using this, this essential, essentially, um, you know, arbitrary, but, but uniform measure, um, we're, we're defining things more consistently and really picking up the heart of metropolitan areas and the densest part of them. Uh, a place like Chicago, for example, um, is, you know, the city of Chicago is losing population in the aggregate. These neighborhoods are gaining population and particularly gaining population in this demographic. Right. So this is an important uh, nuance when you read folks like Jed Kalko of Indeed or Joel Kotkin talking about young people leaving cities or not moving into cities. We're talking about different parts. You're talking about the, the really densest parts of, of cities, whereas they're talking about cities in a different way. They're defining their category of cities differently. I, I don't think it does either of those gentlemen justice to, to lump them into the same <laughs> category. <laughs> right. uh, Jed, Jed, Jed and Joel have <clears throat> different different approaches and different, uh, I would argue, different levels of rigor. Um, but yeah, I think your point is, is you know, in the aggregate, I think Jed's point is, is that, that cities are growing more slowly. I think that's true, but we should talk about why that is. But, but Jed, Jed's uh, findings are very consistent with ours in terms of the relative preference of young people for those urban locations, those denser locations. Right. Now, you know, we, we've gotten some uh, some questions from folks in our audience. Please keep them coming. You know, a couple of the questions that we've gotten have been about, you know, what happens once you hit 35? Uh, when, when you become a 35 to 44 year old, Nick was asking this question, how does preference for urban centers change by age? Kay Heimowitz, one of my colleagues also asked, what happens once they have children, what have you been seeing? Yeah, yeah, that's a those are those are great questions. And the first thing I'd say, and this is one of the reasons why we dislike the the millennial or other generational labels, is you know there are two sets of effects here. One is a life cycle effect. Um, at different ages in your life, you do different things, and the other is a generational effect. Um, do twenty five to thirty four year olds today behave differently than twenty five to thirty four year olds of previous generations? And we're clearly in that latter camp. And it's, it's very true that as you get older, you are more likely to live in the suburbs. And as you have children, you are more likely to move outward from cities. But what our data shows is this generation is again more likely, particularly these well-educated young adults, to live in these close in urban neighborhoods than previous generations uh, at that time of life. Um, we've, ha we've had a companion study that we've been working on for a while and, and never gotten to the, you know, to the, the pulling the trigger on publication called Kids in Cities to look at this issue of uh, do well-educated young adults stay in cities? And the answer appears to be um, in some city, I mean, that's the, the critical issue is schools and education. Um, and if, and if uh, parents perceive that it's difficult or impossible to get quality education in, in cities, they, they tend to leave. Although they appear to be living, leaving in smaller numbers or later in life than they did before. And it doesn't take a big shift in that to change 
city populations, um, which is what we've seen. Um, and a couple of places, and I just point, point to Washington DC as a very interesting case, which was an early implementer of universal pre-K. Um, so uh, three and four year olds um, get publicly supported education and it turns out to be, um, to use an unfortunate uh, metaphor, a gateway drug to the public education system. That when uh, parents with young children uh, get into uh, the publicly supported pre-K, they develop the set of networks, the awareness, the familiarity with the system and, um, and are more comfortable living in the city. And then others, you know, it's maybe moving away. So, you know, what happens with public education, I think is, will have a lot to do with uh, what fraction of those folks stay in cities um, as, they, as they rear children. On the life cycle point, you know, this is something that Ed Glazer in one of his recent papers, Urbanization and Discontents, talked about how, you know, we've seen maybe the past couple decades of urban growth, uh, a lot of private sector growth, a lot of productivity growth, more young people moving into closer neighborhoods. But there is a question as to whether the public capacity to satisfy that demand has grown in turn. So, you know, maybe more talent moving into closer neighborhoods, but it's but it's an open question as to whether schools have actually improved in order to keep pace with that demand, which could be a problem as, you know, younger people do age, they get married, they have kids, and then realize that the schools are just not up to par. But but on your, you can feel free to respond to that, but on the generational question, uh, one of, someone in the audience asked, you know, are, why are, what what can you see from the data as to why you know, this particular generation seems to be more attracted to central business districts. You know, you did make the point that it was about broader economic forces. Are there, are there other factors that may be making these city centers more attractive to younger folks now? Um, yeah, and, and in, in our original Young and Restless research, which we published more than a decade ago, um, Carol Coletta and I looked at those questions. We did a lot of survey work, a lot of focus group work um, on, uh, on what are the, the uh, uh, motivations behind people wanting to be in cities. And we came up with, you know, you know what we heard in, in particularly in focus group work and in survey work was uh, young, well-educated people wanted places that were dense, diverse, and interesting and that were walkable, bikeable, and well served by transit. So a lot of you know, kind of urban amenities, I, I think, uh, figure prominently in that. Um, another way to put it, which may be a little more familiar to the Manhattan Institute audience, is uh, Robert Lucas had a great line: um, uh, "What is it that people can be paying urban rents for if not access to other people?" And I think that's, you know, that's the underlying thing here is the opportunities for social interaction um, that exist. And, the, and, and there are a lot of um, externalities uh, associated with having lots of other people around you, um, some of them negative, but a lot of them positive in terms of social and consumption opportunities. You have a richer array of everything from bars and restaurants to clubs to um, you know, personal networks and so on in cities. Uh, and I think that's you know, the interesting thing with this generation is you know, the, the, um, the technology side is a given. You know, that's ubiquitous. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, but if you're gonna get access to people, cities provide uh, unparalleled opportunities to, to, to do that. The other thing that I think is important, uh, particularly in light of the unrest in cities right now is, I think there's just a fundamentally different attitude about race um, in the US and among this generation. And that in the 1960s, you know, racial fear was, was clearly a motivator for white flight and why, why a generation of, you know, typically baby boomers and or their parents uh, exited cities. I don't think that that's not what the way um, a significant fraction of the younger generation views race relations. Uh, and there's a lot less fear and concern. Uh, and in spite of the unrest in cities, I don't think, hear anybody saying, oh, it's time to uh, leave because of uh, fear of uh, minorities. What, what, what is, just out of curiosity, what is the racial component of this youth movement in this urban renaissance? Uh, what, um, is there is there a difference between white, black, Hispanic, Asian? What what are you seeing? 
Yeah, and we, we've looked at that in a couple of things, I would say. One is um, uh, it, it, white, white folks moving back to cities is absolutely a big part of it. Again, the flow historically, when you look at it over time, was outward for a long time. And that has reversed in a very big way. Um, and and one word, I'll post a link to this because we wrote a piece on this um, some months back at City Observatory. The other thing I'd say is, um, when we've looked in detail at African Americans, the interesting thing about African Americans, well-educated young African Americans, is they have become more evenly distributed throughout the United States than they have ever been. So when you look at concentrations of African Americans, the, the, the places that are historically the centers for, for, for African Americans, um, the, the South and the uh, large cities of the Northeast and Midwest, those places have been losing share largely of well-educated young African-Americans. And they've been moving to um, other cities where, where they're, that are less historically concentrated. So that's the first thing. There, there, there is an exception to that. The exception is Atlanta. Atlanta is the place that gained share of, of uh, well-educated young African-Americans. Um, the other thing we know is that, um, you know, the best way to put this is suburbanization is still aspirational for a lot of African, young African-Americans in the way it is for white people. So while white people in the aggregate have been moving towards city centers, uh, young, well-educated white people, young, well-educated black people have been, relatively speaking, suburbanizing relative to what they did in the past. So uh, I think this is a, actually a great transition to getting into more of the critiques or some of the nuance here. So this is a question also from the audience, given the acceleration of highly educated young people moving into urban centers, to what extent should we be concerned about questions of gentrification and displacement, and especially in light of the, uh, the racial makeup that you just described? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and you know, I think there are answers on a couple of levels. The first is, um, and I want to tackle the displacement. I, I think in a sense, we have a zero sum uh, model in our head that if one person moves in, then one person moves out. And, and, um, and actually in the aggregate, these close in urban neighborhoods gained population during um, the last six years that we've looked at. So there, and, and vacancy rates have fallen some in cities. Uh, and we've built some new housing in cities. But the question of whether there's displacement or not has a lot more to do, I think, with whether we allow new housing to get built than it does uh, who's moving into cities. And, and I think the problem has been, we've made it really, really difficult to build new housing in cities where there's a lot of demand. And I think there's a public policy issue too of, you know, do we do we do spend enough on affordable housing? And I don't, my opinion would be we do not. Um, so that's one thing. The, the second thing I'd say on the gentrification literature or the gentrification argument is, I don't think people um, distinguish between gentrifying and gentrification. And if you go back to Ruth Glass, the, the, the English sociologist who coined the term in the 60s, she described gentrification as the wholesale replacement of one population with another. You know, and the idea is it goes from an all black poor neighborhood to an all white rich neighborhood. And that's, you know, that's, that's that phase change, that state change is I think what people think of when they think of gentrification, but the way it's always measured uh, is, is there any increase in the number of white or higher income people in a neighborhood? And it's very possible for a neighborhood to gain some white people, some college educated people, some young people without losing all of the, all of the previous residents. And in fact, the careful studies that have been done on this show very little displacement in these neighborhoods. So neighborhoods can change without flipping entirely in one direction. So what, and, and we've done another study called America's uh, diverse mixed income neighborhoods, which you can find at City Observatory. And it turns out the neighborhoods that people define as gentrifying are in the aggregate much more diverse racially and economically than the typical neighborhood in a metropolitan area. So despite the fact that they're quote unquote gentrifying, they are very much more integrated in every way than uh, typical neighborhoods in cities or suburbs. And, and also to add, there seems to be a difference in gentrification between cities, uh, certainly between 
or in, in the rate in which cities are or neighborhoods are gentrifying, you know, certainly when we think of the picture of a gentrifying neighborhood, maybe we think of Williamsburg and Brooklyn, maybe we think mm -hmm. of Capitol Hill or U Street in Washington, D.C., but their stories surely are very different from Rust Belt cities. Surely their story are very different from Sun Belt cities. Oh, C cities yeah. are not made the same. And the story of gentrification or that of gentrifying neighborhoods also seems to vary greatly. Yeah, ab absolutely. And the, the, the other thing, and it has to be said, is that gentrification is um, remarkably rare. And we've, we've done another study uh, called... Uh, um, uh, lost in place, and it, it was essentially updated by Economic Innovation Group uh, just a couple of months ago, and their findings were almost identical to ours, that, you know, that for every neighborhood that gentrifies, nine other poor neighborhoods stayed just as poor and lost population. So vastly more people are displaced by uh, poverty and economic decline from poor neighborhoods than are displaced by um, richer, wider people moving in. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to I want to pivot here to a to a different topic, but I think a really fair critique here and a number of people in the audience are bringing this up. You know, we've seen an enormous rise in remote work during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation that uh, we actually had as a Manhattan Institute event with Adam Ozemek from Upwork. You know, we, we see an enormous rise in remote work. Uh, there's a lot of very high profile companies that have said that they're going to continue remote work for some time surveys done by, you know, groups as varied both as Upwork, but to the New York times as well, suggesting that both workers and managers want to continue some degree of remote relationship going forward. Um, what is, what, what, certainly that is a charge against this this optimistic view of the urban renaissance continuing, or is it not? Is it just a question of, you know, of timing or which cities may be affected more than others? How do you respond yeah. to the charge that this is the, the end of the renaissance of, of American cities? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I have to say it remains to be seen. Um, so I, but I'm too, skeptical. Too soon to tell. Yeah. With any sort of, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, but, but a couple of things, first of all, um, it, the, the, the assumption is that the only reason that people live in cities is because of jobs is because of access to jobs. And I, I, I think, and, and again, I point to, to Ed Glazer wrote a wonderful piece 15 years ago, very prescient called the consumer city. And the reason people live in cities is not just because there are jobs there. It's because of consumption opportunities. And I use that term extremely broadly to include uh, a variety of opportunities for social interaction as well. That's, com I think, completely undiminished by this as, you know, everybody is, is I think, painfully aware of sort of the kiss through the screen door um, nature of um, these various technological workarounds that we have. So there's a whole set of things that I think people are ignoring. It's not just about where you work. Uh, and then the, the other thing I'd say is, I think, you know, that um, remote, remote work um, and uh, telework works well in the short term for established organizations with established routines where people have a strong set of relationships to build upon. What's really unclear is whether you can onboard new people create new organizations and create new ideas, products and the like strained through um, this narrow um, uh, um, technology, this very limiting technology. So I think it's a great workaround in the short term for, for some people, for some activities where you have a strong base to build on, but is, is really problematic for the, create, the creative activities of all kinds and the, the interpersonal activities that, that, um, that um, depend on uh, propinquity and that for which firms and people have been willing to pay a substantial premium for those opportunities in the past. So um, it, it also I, must be said that, that ju just because someone moves out of a big, costly coastal city due to remote work, that doesn't mean that they're going to leave cities or urban America altogether. They oh, just may move exactly. to another city. 
Exactly. And, and we did a piece on this a couple of weeks ago at City Observatory. You know, one of the articles said, yeah, there's people moving away from Silicon Valley and the woman relocated to Seattle. Right. So it's that, you know, again, people gravitate towards cities. But the other thing here is, too, I think there's a, you know, there's a difference between um, a mid-career person who has established their reputation, has a developed network, has a high level of proficiency in a particular set of skills, and an, somebody in their early 20s who's just starting out. And I think what one of the attractions of cities is it's a place for people to find their way through the thick labor markets to get a really good match with um, a job that taps their skills and creative energy. Um, and that, again, I think that's very, very difficult to replicate with just remote work. Right. And I think so, what I hear you saying is that you're defending the demand for cities. You're, you're saying that there's, there's still many signs that we demand what cities offer. The question is, will we be supplying enough, let's just call it enough, enough city for that demand? So, you know, maybe if you're talking about somebody moving out of a city because of high housing costs, you know, maybe that's not necessarily a problem with cities, but a problem of the governance of the city, the, the yeah. poor governance, not being able to provide enough housing where there's demand or not addressing crime issues or cleanliness issues or, or providing good schooling for kids. Those are governance questions affecting mm -hmm. the supply of the thing we want in cities, not necessarily an indictment of cities themselves or of the demand for them, right? Exactly. And I think, you know, you've, you've touched on what is a really important issue is, and, and I haven't mentioned this, but this increase in the number of well-educated young adults living in cities has happened at a time when city rents have gone up, okay? So more people are moving, uh, this group of, are moving to cities, even though it's more expensive to do so. And as an economist, that tells me two things. One, they place, produce, place a very high value on urban living. Um, and the firms that are paying high rents in those cities also place a high value in being in those locations. And the second thing is, it's telling me we don't have enough, uh, enough great cities and enough housing in the great cities that we do have. So I think the two, the two policy implications to me are we need to you know, make it easier to build more housing in the places that people want to live. And then, you know, given that I think it is density that people are craving or certain you know, the attributes or advantages that come with density, we need to be building more great, dense, livable places that are walkable, bikeable, well served by transit and have a range of um, public amenities and private services. So, so these are these are some things that we, looking ahead to the future, some things that policymakers can do to ensure that this youth movement into America's close in neighborhoods and our cities continues. Is there any difference between what, you know, let's say the mayor of a superstar city should be doing versus the mayor of a regional uh, hub, a second tier city should do versus the mayor of a downtrodden city? Are there, are there differences between those categories? I just think they have different issues that they need to work on. In the superstar cities, it's obvious, you know, housing supply is really a critical issue. Housing supply, housing cost, affordability. Um, and if you, you know, if you're concerned about displacement and affordability, then you've got to have more housing. And I think in in some of the more struggling cities, it's, it's it has a lot to do with uh, quality of life, urban amenities and the like. Right. It, it, and it also suggests that there's even more that we could do to accelerate this youth movement. You know, I, there's one way of looking at what you found that says, wow, look, look at how many young people are still moving into closer neighborhoods. There's another way of looking at this that says, why aren't even more moving in? And, yeah. you know, considering the structural factors that are, that are pushing young talent into cities, right? Yeah, I think that I think that's there is an unrequited demand here, and I think that you know, and and um, Enrico Moretti has done some at Berkeley has done some really interesting work on this, and and I think you know part of what's happening is there probably is some some displacement in the sense that um, some of the people who would like to live in cities can't afford to do so, and that what we're seeing is a sorting that that they're getting outbid by. Um, well, better educated, you know, higher income 
folks who, who can't afford to live there. So it's an equity issue as well of if we could create more affordability in cities, then more people of all kinds could, could uh, of all, all education levels could live in cities. Right. So what, what could change? You, you've talked about trends that will continue uh, uh, through coronavirus, post-coronavirus. What, what could actually change post-coronavirus? So, you know, while we'll still wait to see what happens with remote work, um, certainly a, a large portion of this young talent moved to cities for the labor market. You know, it's not mm -hmm. just the amenities. The, maybe the amenities keep them, keep cities kind of sticky, but they moved for jobs. So what could change post coronavirus? Let's break it down into, into time frames. So maybe yeah. over the next two I was just years say, versus a decade, yeah. right? Because those are two different pictures. Yeah, I think the the two the two things that I think are really interesting if you if you think about again bars and restaurants as a, sort of being a, a an indicator of you know quasi public quasi private amenities in cities you know the fact that there's been a lot of devastation to that and a lot of reticence by people to you know for very good reason to 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 be in those places and have those experiences and how quickly we can work through that, I think is, is really important. Um, uh, and, you know, that's the kind of interaction that I think cities excel at and that is their advantage. And, you know, for a period of time, um, it's, it's going to be very much more subdued and how quickly that comes back is, is a very big question. Um, the other thing that I think about is, you know, how we travel and use public space. Uh, and I think that one of the things that the stay at home orders and stay at home behavior, because people are doing it regardless of whether they're ordered to or not, is um, I think people have a new appreciation of um, the importance of having accessible, walkable urban spaces. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about it, it, it's brought into sharp focus how much of our public realm is dedicated to automobiles to their movement, to parking, and how that systematically privileges people who are moving through a place as opposed to the people who just want to be there. Uh, and, and I would expect um, that this experience may have accelerated um, you know, a, an interest in how we rethink the urban realm to give more priority to people who aren't just simply encased in vehicles. You know, uh I'm I'm wondering what your considering all the data that you found, considering all that you know, what's your what's your sort of core message? And I think it's a message of hope. What, what is your message for city leaders? And let's even be more specific. You you reside in Oregon. You spend a lot of time in Portland, Oregon. If you were to speak to the mayor of uh, Portland or to, even to a governor of Oregon, what would you? say to them to ensure the continued success of Portland and of Oregon's urban areas going into the future, particularly for young talent? Um, you know, I, th I think um, urban livability and housing are the two priorities. How do you, again, build, build a great city for people to live in? That's, that's an attractive place to live. Um, and then how do you uh, provide housing, both market rate housing and subsidized housing that enables people to live there. Um, so th those are the two things. I'd say that to, to, to a lot of mayors, it's the mix of those two, two strategies uh, may change a little bit. Um, but basically but, those but two, ultimately, those two it, But ultimately it is one of hope, right? It is, it is a message of hope for cities in a time when there's there's a lot of scary headlines out there and a lot of and a lot of yeah. uh, evidence at least in anecdotal evidence that some people are leaving but ultimately what you're saying is that this young talent has been moving in for decades some of them are here to stay and we need to be doing everything we can to ensure that they have particularly as they grow older the and start families have the ability to stay if they so desire yeah i think that's you know one of the things that will determine whether they say again is, is what we do with education in cities. Um, and, and you're right, it is competitive uh, among cities, but I do think, um, again, the most powerful bit of evidence here has been the, the movement of lots of young people and 
the rising rents and higher prices in cities, which is a signal that people and firms attach value to being there. So, you know, again, that economic evidence to me is, um, is very persuasive in, in being optimistic about the future of cities. Well, Joe, it's, it's been wonderful to speak with you. Please follow Joe and his work at City Observatory. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Joe, great to be with you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Good to see you, Michael.